This presentation outlines some thoughts and ideas that I've put together around creating a sensory space at the Children's Memorial Institute. Uh, this is following a brief from the board of the CMI on what this idea could look like. So we all know about the CMI and its wonderful history, um, but the most important thing to, to note is that on the 29th of October of this year, we turn 100 years of age. So that's 100 years of celebrating child health and wellness in the City of Gold. When I was first briefed on this project, um, Barry took me on a tour of all the different spaces and I asked him, what do you really want to get out of this? And his question was, how do we get people out there to understand and connect with the amazing stuff that's happening inside the CMI? So as you know, this is the entrance and this is hopefully going to be the entrance to the new CMI sensory space. Before getting into the strategy of the sensory space, I thought I'd spend some time looking at some of the amazing brands that are housed within this incredible environment. And you can pretty much break those down into three key focus areas. We've obviously got a bunch of organizations that look after child protection and therapeutic services. We have organizations that look after child diversity, support and inclusion. And we have organizations that look after child rights and the empowerment of children. So obviously many organizations fit across all three of these different areas, but when I talk about child protection and therapeutic services, I'm talking about organizations like ABBA, Babies Matter, Childline, Hotel Hope Ministries, JPCCC, Lafika, the Sunlight Center, Teddy Bear Clinic, Tusanani, and the Peter Dontek Society of South Africa. When we talk about child diversity, support and inclusion, we're talking about Autism South Africa, Save the Disabled Children, the Ernie Els Foundation, the Autism School, Malamulele, um, Sunshine Association and Snowball's um, Autism Care Centre. And finally, when we talk about children's rights and empowerment, we're talking about a chance to play, ACFS, Africa Takun, Fight with Insight, Gauteng Children's Rights Committee, Pilele and JCAF. So when we think about the overall project, it's probably a little bit bigger than just a sensory space. We actually have four key objectives. The first is how do we build a community, a cohesive community of brands endorsed by the CMI and that all support each other. The second is how do we showcase our living memorial, past, present and future. The third is to create awareness and revenue opportunities for all of our NPOs, because we know funding is really tough in South Africa at the moment. And finally, how do we create a center of research excellence for ongoing learning and understanding in this space? So to the first objective, how do we go about building a cohesive community of brands endorsed by the CMI that all support each other? So this is obviously quite a big strategic brand process. And just to illustrate that these are some of the brands I've worked on, on similar types of, of challenges where we have to try and bring people together under a central brand and understand what that means for different people. So you may be wondering what that big building was on the opening slide of the section, and it's actually the old Battersea power station, which was repurposed into the Tate Modern, which is a museum for contemporary art. And um, what's amazing is that they've taken this old space, but they've created a really fantastic contemporary brand. There are huge retail opportunities that people tap into. It's an incredibly engaging space. You get there and they encourage you to draw and be creative. They've got these very exciting installations. So this massive spider with the bunk beds underneath. I've got pictures of my children crawling around in those bunk beds, so it's a bit creepy. Um, but its real purpose is to showcase other brands. And those other brands are the wonderful artists of the 20th and 21st century. So the likes of Georgia O'Keeffe, the likes of Monet, the likes of Vincent van Gogh and Dali and so on. And what they do is they create awareness and relevance for these incredible brands um, that people can then engage with. So they create this community that you can go and touch these amazing brands. And I think that's what we're trying to do as the CMI is to create this wonderful contemporary brand where people can come and engage with these incredible NPO brands and understand that whole community. So this is just a review of the brand design elements that we have. We obviously have our CMI brand primary brand identity. We have our online website. We've got our social media. But what's really exciting, and I think the stuff that we all love, is this brand architecture that we all live within. Um, there's the modern and contemporary with these beautiful hexagonal shapes and these beehive type motifs, this wonderful lighting. And then obviously the Memorial Hall is sort of an, a nod to the history and where we've come from. 
Sadly, however, there's quite a lot of brand fragmentation. And what I mean by that is we do tend to, as a community, we go into our spaces, we look after our spaces, and then we go and stick stuff up on the walls outside to say, this is where we can find us. But there's nothing really pulling us together. So we see these sort of fragmented little messages out there in the in the hallway. Um, there's some notice boards that aren't really well maintained. Um, there's sort of random placing of our logos. There's some rather scary uh, murals um, of children on the walls. And then, of course, we've got this memorial space where sometimes we do exhibitions and so on. Um, but there's nothing really pulling us all together. And that's what we need to address. What we do have is lots of beautiful brand iconography in our architecture that we can use to actually pull us all together and to unite us. So you will have noticed that when I was talking about all these different individual areas, I had almost like a little color swatch for each of the individual brands. And all I did was I took the primary brand color from each brand and I put it into that hexagonal shape that is so associated with the CMI. Um, and here I've just turned them into little kites. Um, but already you can start to see how we're about children, we're about uh, playfulness, we're about um, helping children to engage with their childhoods better and their health and well-being. So already we start to see a community um, emerging from some of these this iconography. Um, whenever I work with brands in quite complex brand engagement processes, the key is to bring people together and to get people to think about, well, what's our brand about and how do we connect to each other? And so what I'd like to recommend is that the first thing we do is a brand engagement workshop. And in this workshop, um, we'd obviously hold this workshop with representatives from all of the CMI NPOs, um, as well as the board. And what we can do in that session is introduce everybody to world-class branding. We can help ask all of you to help us develop our collective market definition as the CMI. So what is it we're trying to do here? We'd also enable people to have a bit of a think about their brands and how to optimize their brands. And then we'd like to use this as an opportunity to develop win-win brand uh, strategies between each organization. So how are we supporting each other as partners? And how do we build our community through this partnership process? We'd also obviously like to develop our shared CMI brand values. We live in a community. What are those values that we believe in and that should guide our behavior as members of that community? We'd love your input in this workshop into the 100-year celebration efforts. Um, there's obviously also a lovely opportunity to develop some individual retail brand opportunities and then obviously to develop some sort of action planning and next steps. Um, so this would be our first step is an, a brand engagement workshop where we try and cover off each of these elements. So in that session, obviously, I'd like you to confirm your, your primary brand colors that you'd like to incorporate as part of this brand community. But also we can use it as an opportunity to, to brainstorm some really cool branded retail opportunities. So I've given a few examples here, but the example of the teddy bear clinic, this is actually the annual Harrods teddy bear. And it's a real um, luxury item. People go and look for the annual Harrods teddy bear. What nicer thing to do for the teddy bear clinic than to have an annual teddy bear clinic bear. And maybe we can create a competition around the creation of the bear and the manufacturing of the bear. And each year we have a new teddy bear clinic bear that people can buy into. So the 2023 one would be for the birthday and then we would take it on from there. I've already chatted to the team at Sunshine Association, but it's we were discussing how we could create maybe therapeutic cushions and we call them sunshine bums, uh, which we could put where the you could put where the sun don't shine. Um, and then, of course, Fight with Insight. We've uh, Luke and I have always been chatting about amazing retail opportunities for Fight with Insight, where people can tap into the tools we use both for the boxing program and the autism boxing program. So the next objective is thinking about how to showcase our living memorial past, present and future. And this is actually a picture from the um, Black History Museum in Washington. Um, and I just love the, the really classy approach to showcasing um, an amazing history. So this is sort of to scale, but this is the space we're talking about, creating a museum of child health and wellness in the City of Gold. We have our atrium, which is very much about the past. We have our passage and entrance hall, which is very much around the present. And then, of course, we have our sensory space, which is about the future. As you know, this is our memorial hall, and this is the space that we look to memorializing the past. 
So obviously the CMI archive team would very, very much need to drive the content in this area, but we'd look to build a history of child health and well-being in the city of gold, from the establishment of Johannesburg as a mining town to the first child-centered um, uh, welfare organizations, child health services in the early days, possibly even the relationship between African traditional medicines and more modern day Western biomedical traditions, the impact of disease, war and unrest on childhoods, the establishment of the living memorial and who it remembers, um, key figures in child health and wellness in Johannesburg, um, innovations that happened in this area and possibly even a rogues gallery. So these are just some pictures illustrating the early days of Johannesburg, the original town, the miners, how the town grew, uh, the Johannesburg children's home, uh, some of the maps. This is actually a picture from our own archives looking at the nurses in the early days. And this is a, a painting of Doverwood, the battle where many South Africans lost their lives. These are examples of some medical museums around the world and how they showcase their medical histories. Um, and actually in the bottom right hand corner are the um, the display cases that have been donated to us for this very purpose. And what we really want to do is find interesting ways of sharing our information and our history. So here are a few examples, um, possibly developing an architectural progression model that shows the old part of the CMI and the new part of the CMI, maybe even that lights up. This used to be a dental studio and now it's Fife with Insight. Um, so just a way of really bringing the building and its progression and its history to life. Uh, the next picture illustrates the Tate Modern has this wonderful timeline that shows when various artists started, were born and started painting and started producing their work. Um, so we could look at some kind of a timeline. And finally, the last picture actually is an amazing exhibition called Cradle to Grave, which looks at every single pill that a person takes in their lifetime in a blister pack that stretches about 40 meters. So from your early vitamins as a child all the way through to your heart medication as an old person, kind of what 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 is all the medication that you that you take? So really interesting ways of talking to health and well-being and medicine and so on. So this is what the Memorial Hall looks like currently. And this is how we could turn it into more of a museum space where we have beautiful pictures on the wall showcasing our history. We have exhibitions and possibly models illustrating uh, the sort of the clothing that was worn at the time. This illustrates one of the side walls. And here I've just added a timeline at the top that talks to how Johannesburg has developed over the years and when CMI was actually launched as a hospital and some of the history of South Africa, as well as possibly an ex some exhibition spaces, the progression model, or looking at biomedical traditional versus Western biomedical traditions. So where the atrium represents um, highlighting the past, the passage and the entrance represent where we can showcase what's happening in the present and really highlighting our various NPOs and the work we're doing around child protection and support, around neurodiversity and inclusion, and around child rights and empowerment. This is obviously the passageway and the entrance to the sensory space. And although this is just a walkway, we want to try and make it as interactive as possible. So this is an example of an exhibition space where they're asking you to design your best life. But the point is that people are able to stick things on the wall and actually get involved. Here's an example where people are asked to vote on something and to the right where people are asked to share their thoughts in the form of post-it notes. So this is the wall on the left, and this is an area that I really feel that we can talk about child protection and children's rights. So this is an area where I thought courage could maybe play a role. Um, obviously, the material in courage is very much about working within other organizations, and it speaks specifically to what children's rights and needs are, what kind of challenges, child protection challenges are happening in communities, and obviously the child protection process in terms of our Children's Act. And so we could create an interactive wall where people can literally use post-its and pens to say these are the kinds of challenges that I've seen in my community. And obviously it's all picture-based, so it's quite accessible. On the top, you'll actually see another timeline. And this timeline speaks to when each of our partner organizations was actually uh, formed. So kind of gives a bit of history as to the present in terms of when these organizations started. And then on the right, I've got what I call the brand partnership wall, which is where I'd like to give each organization one of these hexagonal spaces where they can share the vision of their organization, a QR code that can link people directly into their website and the work that they do, 
And then finally, a very simple standardized approach to trying to get donations from people should they want to give you a donation. And the reason for this is it actually started with Childline. Um, I work a lot in communities and I wanted to contribute to Childline because they are the support to the work I do. And um, I went onto Snapscan and put an amount in. And the first question they asked was, would you like to do this on a monthly basis, this donation? And I said, yes. So it's a really nice way of getting people to donate, but then donate on a small amount on an ongoing basis. This is the opposite wall on the right hand side. And in this space, I was thinking we could do something around the neurodiversity and inclusion as well as child empowerment. So we could create some kind of a poster around what is neurodiversity and some sort of an interactive exercise where we try and get people to understand that we all have a level of neurodiversity within us. So even if it's giving people some markers or some coins that they can put into a bottle and each of the bottles represent different kinds of neurodiversity challenges. So sensory sensitivity or anxiety or um, you know um, challenges with concentration and so on so really kind of talking about how it's something that we all need to be aware of and then obviously the partner walls to the left speaking to all of our neurodiversity partners and then further to the left speaking to our child empowerment partners this is obviously the entrance to the proposed sensory space and I think just to point out that I think the murals that have that are sitting currently in the CMI they very much speak to, I think, what people think we're doing inside, but they don't really give an indication of how we go about doing that. So the kinds of kind of experiences we're trying to get children to, to feel and to, to have and to help them therapeutically. So I think if we can try and um, achieve that with our visual material, I think that would be so much more powerful. And this is the kind of artwork I'm referring to. On the left, you can see work by Morag Myerskoch. Um, at the top was from the Summer of Love exhibition, which was all about community and connection. Below was work she did for a children's hospital in the UK. Uh, to the right is a lovely ribbon installation at one of the color factory um, museums. And down below the lovely Paul Smith brand, which is all like these wonderful explosions of color and really kind of experiential. So if you can imagine, we could turn this space into something like this, where we've taken all of our partner colors and we've created this beautiful um, wallscape, uh, which brings together all the partner brands through color, but also gives people a sensory experience. And then also I'd love to do a ribbon installation um, because anytime there's any kind of movement, those ribbons will move and will create wonder and enjoyment for, for anybody coming into the sensory space. Moving off from that atrium, I think it's also important that we start looking at the passages that lead off and how this space connects to the rest of the building and the rest of the organizations. So here you can see I've used that simple flag motif to illustrate where some of our partner brands can be found from Africa to Kun to ACFS to uh, JCAF and so on. Um, we can say we can point to where these different organi organizations are from the central atrium. We can also look at using some of our gorgeous iconography on the more modern side of our building. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this uh, particular mural. So how can we make this more contemporary? So here's an example where we could just simply paint it with chalk paint um, and then put the, um, the beautiful iconography on that wall and then actually encourage people to share their inspirational messages about children or about peace or about wellness so we could have chalk there and people could actually write their messages and it could become a very much a living wall and on this space again using our partner colors and our architectural feature of these uh, beautiful triangles and using different colors to really bring the space to life and make it a bit more fun and contemporary and sensorial so this is looking across towards Fight with Insight and uh, Lafika and Teddy Bear Clinic. And once again, we continue that stripe motif using our partnership colors. Moving down that wall, we could also look at creating some kind of structure to our sign posting. So here a suggestion is that we, we use that hexagonal shape just to create some boards that people can actually put their signs on to create a bit more structure and to do it within a bit more of a brand language. And once again, the kite motif to indicate where different partner brands exist.
And finally, not my favorite one, but um, quite a dominant mural in the building. And here I'd love to speak to some of our existing beautiful iconography that exists on the, on the outside of the building to see how we could bring that inside. And this is potentially what it could look like. Once again, using our partner brands within that iconic hexagonal uh, shape and showing how they can come together in this beautiful celebration of color. So moving on to the actual sensory space, this is really about imagining what that sensory space could look like. So I am no designer, but if I were to think about an identity for the space, looking at existing brand equity, I started thinking about obviously the very iconic hexagonal shape. I started thinking about the light and color spectrum that we often see in the building. I thought about things like the neurodiversity symbol of infinity with the kaleidoscope of colors. And I also thought about, you know, our energy centers and creating energy in the building. So this is obviously the different colors we, that represent the various chakras. And potentially we could look at creating a very bright and vibrant identity for the sensory space that brings all of those elements together. And I think it works really nice in a monochrome identity as well, either white on black or black on white. This is obviously how we'll predominantly see it um, when it's printed uh, because it's, it's a, a monochrome approach. Um, and I think it, it really kind of speaks to the brand and what we're trying to achieve. So this is the space we are referring to. Um, it's sort of to scale. Um, each block represents about a meter squared. And I've broken it into an airspace, a sea space, a land space, a chill space, and a retail space. So the jagged red line shows you how you would traverse the space from the entrance. Um, I'm sure you'll notice that there are um, existing used spaces here. So the Sunshine Center lecture theater uh, or workshop area and Tusanani's therapy room. Um, and because we are a living memorial, um, it's all about uh, understanding that some spaces might not be available. But you have got between 12 and 14 exhibition spaces. If you spend just five minutes in each, you've got 60 to 90 minutes of fun and engagement in a wonderful sensory experience. So starting off with our air zone, this is the passageway for the air zone. So this is very much the welcome space, um, the air passage, and here you would find lockers where you could put your shoes. Uh, we'd like people to traverse the space in their socks. Um, we might even make so uh, sensory space socks available for purchase. Um, there would be what we call licorice chairs, repurposed tires that look like licorice sweets. If you haven't done it online, this is where you'd fill out your uh, indemnity, safety and hygiene briefings and informations and agreements. Um, but this is very much the introduction to what are your different senses, maybe trying to, through an interactive sensory wall, trying to experience your different senses. And there would very much be a visual sensory environment feel to it. Um, what we'd love to do is actually develop a, an app that takes you through the space, which you can actually fill out um, either on your phone or on a piece of paper. And each experience you have, you then fill out what your exp sensory experience was of it, which would then give you a very basic sensory profile at the end of the whole experience with the sensory space. Moving into the Sunshine Lecture Theatre and Workshop space. Because it's about the air, we'd love to turn the space into a big sunshine room um, where the decor looks very much like sunshine. There is an entrance to the sun. Um, there is different kinds of seating options like big bouncy balls, yellow balls and uh, sunshine uh, therapy seats. Um, and obviously this is a space where we can run workshops, but if it's in use, it would obviously be closed. Um, but it's also a, a wonderful space that if there's no one there, we can just have a sensory video on loop, which explains about sensory, the, the whole sensory world and what that's about. On the right is actually a picture from the uh, the the Tain Bodden, where they did an installation called The Sun during winter in London. And uh, people loved it so much, they used to come and spend their lunch break there just so that they could see the sun, even if it wasn't warm, they could have the experience of seeing the sunlight and, and have the, the therapeutic benefits of that. So moving on to the Tusanani Cloud Room, um, this is obviously a working therapeutic space. So it either is going to be used to offer therapy to children or to run workshops so that people can understand how to offer therapy or support their children. Um, but obviously because we're in the in the air, um, we'd like to make, turn it into a cloud room. 
so we'd very much like to bring the idea of a cloud room to life visually. And for this, we use the Snoozeland concept of having a very neutral sensory space, which you can then introduce sensory input in the form of sound or light or visual cues that and textures that assist the child in, in their therapy. Um, this has been found to be incredibly beneficial, not just to neurodiverse children, but also to children who've experienced great trauma. So a combination of lighting, um, of textured walls, um, some examples on the bottom left of some ball ponds that we've actually done at uh, Tara and at uh, Fight with Insight, and then bringing through the, the cloud iconography and, and the, the sun, moon and stars um, as part of that whole air idea. So moving on to the sea space, and this is obviously beyond the passageway, this is a dedicated sensory space environment. This is the passageway we're referring to. And we'd like to turn this into a coral garden, a textured sensory coral garden. It has a textured or tactile walkway. It has a touchable wall that you can interact with. It has mobiles of the sea hanging from the roof. It has interesting things to walk on that give you sensory experience. And this is very much where you'd have a soundscape and the sound of the sea would be dominant in this environment. In the sea zone, the first space you would walk into is the kelp forest maze and the tidal touch pool. So the first space you would engage with is the tidal touch pool. And this would be actually a wet space where children could actually put their hands in or any, any visitors could put their hands in and actually touch and feel created sponges and corals and sea life and sand. Um, but obviously it's all created. So there's no chance of anyone being stung or any problems around that. You would then turn left into the kelp forest maze. Um, the the um, maze is illustrated at the bottom of the slide. And on the left, um, you can see the, the sort of uh, decor we're looking at. It's very much creating the experience of swimming through a kelp forest. Um, and the materials we'd like to use for this is very much recycled plastics. Um, the examples of the pictures I've given you here are from the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, where they've actually created um, a art installation of recycled plastics as a kelp forest. Um, there's some examples of some of the animals you would find, octopus and shy sharks and so on in the kelp forest. And then a lighting solution that would actually, this is actually called a meteor light, and it actually brings light down into the forest. So it looks like the sun is shining down into the forest. So you'd walk through this maze and you'd come out the door further along the passage. Across the passage, you would come to the jellyfish bounce zone. And this would be very much a smooth tactile space where you could bounce on exercise balls. And all around you, you've got this wonderful lighting um, which is very much ultraviolet lighting of various jellyfish and um, and bounce in this environment. So it's, it's quite a fun, sort of smooth textured experience. You would then move next door into quite a small room again, and that's the anemone balance zone. And this room is, is almost um, pretending like you're Nemo swimming through an anemone. Um, so it's very textured. And um, on the left-hand side, you can actually see real anemones. But on the right-hand side, was actually a crochet exhibition at a design in Darbo one year. And these, all of these poofs are actually made from crocheting and they look like sea anemones. We'd obviously also have lots of squishy toys that you can hang on to. And this is very much a balance board zone. So where the previous room was about bouncing, this room is about balancing. Finally, in the sea zone, you'd come to the whale chill room. And this is really paying homage to the, the beauty and peace of whales. So you'd go into this room and hear the sound of whales. You would have pictures of whales on the walls, possibly whales sleeping. And this experience would be about either going into a floor pod or into a hanging swing pod and just relaxing in these spaces and listening to the sound of whales speaking and singing to each other. Moving out of the sea zone, we then get to the land zone. And this is the passage we're referring to. So as opposed to the sea space, uh, the land passage is a far more bright and vibrant and energetic and noisy space. Um, on the left, you can see um, the external sensory space I created at Tara, um, where you've got different kinds of stepping stones that get you from A to B. Um, there's potentially a music wall where we've got instruments, African instruments on the wall that you can interact with. It's very much a forest scape, so we'll want to put grass on the floors. Um, the visual um, kind of painting on the walls will very much be the African landscape. 
Um, we'd love to make some um, African textile trees um, out of cardboard and African textiles. Um, and that is very much, uh, and, and the walkway will also have, there will be um, accessible wheelchair space, but on the other side will be sort of a um, different um, heighted uh, stepping stones in wood that will force children to balance and step up and down as part of the engagement process. The first room on the left in the land space is the monkey climbing room. And this is a space of swings and nets and webs and monkey bars. And the iconography is very much kind of being in the canopy amongst the monkeys and swinging through the trees. And so that's the sort of um, experience that we'd like to, to share in this room. Moving across to the right-hand side, we'd like to create what we call a bird flap flap room. In the center of the bird flap flap room is going to be a huge created baobab tree made out of noodles. And around it will be um, a number of small internal uh, trampolines. And we're going to encourage participants to actually bounce on these trampolines and flap their hands like birds. So all around them, they will have lots of colorful South African birds and on the roof. And it's really a space where we're encouraging people to have happy hands and flappy hands. The next room along to the right will be the Boulder Boundary Room. So this room is predominantly a huge colorful ball pit with iconic boulder murals all around it. And then lots of balloons and balls made for bashing and crashing. This is a space where people can find their boundaries and, um, and experience that, that kind of sensory experience of where do I finish and where does the world begin. And this is the final room on the left hand side of the land space. It's the sand sensory room. And this space is very much around um, sand therapy. So the huge success that we're seeing in sand therapy, there'll be sand textured walls, there will be sensory sand stations, there'll be iconic rock art deco on the walls. On the floor, there will be sand decorating, Zen garden opportunities, and possibly even African precious stone interactions, uh, where we, the, the children get to, to hold the stones to themselves and see what kind of energy they feel from the stones. So finally, we move into the chill zone and then into the retail space. This is the chill zone, which then looks onto the retail space. This was just uh, some stimulus around um, the chill zone in one of the color factory centers. For our chill zone, we want to have some more of our licorice uh, tire chairs. We want to have a huge flower mural. On the flower mural, we want to have scratch and sniff interactive stations. Um, this is a space where we want to be able to hand out a little snack pack where people can experience the taste sense and the texture sense in their mouth. So a little snack pack which has possibly a marshmallow and a super sour and maybe a jelly baby so that they can experience different kinds of tastes and different kinds of textures within their mouths. And then also we'd like to have what we call our bee gratitude hive um, where we actually identify all of the people that have uh, contributed towards our sensory space. Um, you'll see some people that we're trying to contact currently to see if they would be, like to be part of our process. So this space would be transformed into this kind of space, both uh, with a, a grass floor, a huge flower mural, and you can see our gratitude hive on the wall. And obviously we'll have these scratch and sniff spaces where you can actually go and touch the wall and, and smell. And, and then of course your sweetie pack that you can taste. This is the retail area. On the left hand side, uh, you've got quite a large room, which I'd like to turn into an art room. So the art room is, is very much a space where we'd like children to try out the different kinds of products we want to sell on behalf of our various partners. So working with partners like Lafika, creating things like a sensory garden pack or a rock art pack or sand art or mask making or sensory clay. Um, and this is a space where the children can actually try out using some of these packs before they then purchase them. Um, it's also got a lovely glass area so we could do portraiture where one child sits on the one side and the other child then draws their face on the other side of the glass. And also if there's small groups or a party, we could also look at having small art workshops in this space. On the right hand side is a relatively small room, uh, which we'd love to turn into either a Lego room or maybe a scratch patch. So we have sent a note to Lego because they're doing so much amazing work in um, diversity and inclusion. This is an example of their Braille Lego. 
Um, and so we're hoping that they'll partner with us. And this will just be a wonderful space where children can literally just go in and actually um, build, you know, various items using Lego. Um, if we can't get them on board and, and Lego is not a possibility, maybe we could look at making it into just a very simple scratch patch, which kids love. And it's a very sensory and tactile experience. Further to the right is, a, is another large room for a retail space. And in this space, we'd like to have all of our sensory toys and therapeutic to toys and so on. Um, obviously, we'd like branded sensory space um, retail that um, could obviously benefit the CMI. Uh, profits from that would benefit the CMI. Uh, lots of sensory toys. Um, we'd also obviously have all of our brand communities retail uh, toys and engagement material there. So the Teddy Bear Clinic's Teddy, the Sunshine Bums Cushion, the Fight with Inside Noodles. This is a space where all of that stuff could happen. I think it's also important to note that in terms of the, the creation or the manufacture of these various uh, toys, we can look at volunteers helping us with that. So the example here of the sensory clay is something that can be made as a, on a volunteer basis. Um, art therapy books, again, could be created. Um, and these little octopi are actually wonderful tools for newborns, especially preemies. Uh, they can hold on to the little tentacles and they're really easy to crochet. So often schools create these um, different products and we could then sell them on behalf of our various partner brands within the CMI. And the last little space on the left is an office space where we could keep some of our administration information. And obviously this whole space would be digitally enabled. So there would be a website where you can, um, in fact, this is the website page currently, where you can book, you can pay, you can do your indemnity, you can do your health, your feedback, and maybe your sensory profile. Um, this is, would very much be a cashless space. Um, so we would need to have a standardized payment platform, but it would all be done online. There would be no cash um, changing hands within the space. So it's important to note that the sensory space obviously is, is not just for um, the public, but also for our children to enjoy and experience. And we would obviously block off time for them to do that. But it is a great opportunity for us to engage with the public and to share with them what we are doing with NCMI and the kinds of organizations who are offering these amazing uh, therapies and, and solutions to children in the context of health and wellness. So um, I have spoken to some of the um, revenue opportunities through ticket sales and through uh, retail, but there is an opportunity for us to really come together as a community and create more awareness and more revenue opportunities as a community uh, by linking together the work we do. That process would start with our brand engagement workshop where we'd speak to everybody about their brands, help them to refine them, help them to figure out kind of who should they be partnering with, how they can work within the overall CMI community and think about their brand and how they can turn that brand into action, whether it's creating retail products, which they can sell for revenue for their organization, doing promotions, doing events, getting sponsorship or donations, um, how they manage their, their social media, how they work through PR, um, and how they really just take their brand to the world around us. When I used to train people in how to create a campaign in my marketing days and branding days, I used to talk about how each campaign idea is made up of lots of different components. In the context of the CMI campaigns, we could have an overall theme and different partners could have different elements to that theme. So for the launch, everybody should be doing something to highlight the launch from their perspective and what it means for them, but then that should link into an overall idea for the whole brand community at CMI. When I talk to people about creating long-term campaigns, I always talk about creating lots of different episodes, so episodic marketing. And that's really about saying, how do we create lots of different themes over time that are relevant to our customers or consumers and their natural timing connections as opposed to our stuff. So obviously we have our launch in October, but um, and potentially launching the school century space, which I'm going to talk to you about later in November. But Christmas is a time of gifting. So maybe that's a focus on sensory gifts. Um, obviously, January is back to school. So, you know, stationary that's um, branded around the sensory space. Um, February, students start thinking about volunteering. So how can we bring them back into our space and get them to help us maintain the space or build on our offering? Um, in uh, March, April, it's always the corporate end of year. So we can start talking to maybe neurodiversity in the workspace and get into the corporate gifting market. 
Um, and then in May, June, obviously that's uh, Child Protection Week, so we can look at, at creating a specific child protection um, theme for our overall community. So obviously we develop all of these themes and, and offerings in partnership with you, our brand partners, but just to bring it to life, uh, we could look at very much a school or corporate package uh, where either schools can come and visit the sensory space or corporates can come and run workshops at the sensory space or have a, a breakout um, free day from work where they come and engage in the sensory space. And that could be made up of, for instance, a welcome and introduction in our memorial hall, an introduction to the work we do at CMI, our child protection rights and neurodiversity work in the foyers, and then maybe breaking the group, if it's say 50 or 60 people, half go into the uh, sunshine room and we run a sensory workshop with them and the other half go into the uh, Tusanani cloud room and have a therapy experience or just an introduction to what sensory therapy could look like and then obviously switch over. And then we could break the group into smaller groups of say five children or five adults per team and each of them could go to a particular room and on a rotational basis over the period of an hour, everyone could have five minutes in each room and in enjoy that sensory experience in each room. We could also create sensory profile activity packs for the schools, uh, obviously the snack packs, and then of course the retail environment where everyone, you know, if it's a corporate um, a function, everyone could get a sensory gift at the end of that, or we could look at um, getting into that corporate gifting market. Um, we could also get schools to sponsor partner schools or organizations. Um, if they don't have the funding to come to the sensory room, we're not looking to overprice the visit, but um, that's one way of getting, making sure that each visit, uh, we get some kind of revenue out of it. And then obviously this is, a, this is a time when we can talk to them about volunteering at the CMI on a regular basis, having volunteering days or events that people could engage with. The final area of focus is how do we take all this amazing work that's happening at the CMI, which I believe is absolutely world class, and turn that into a center of research for ongoing learning. So this is the final area that we'd like to focus on, and this is probably something we look at launching next year or the year after. As some of you know, I did my PhD research into the lived experience of atypical children, and I did a lot of research at the CMI, um, which is how I got to know about you and what you do. Um, part of that research was understanding kind of a cycle of atypical engagement, how atypical children engage with the world, and then all the different challenges that really group together around those different stages of engagement. And one of the big issues that came out there was just understanding the sensory world and observing children engaging with their senses in some of their therapeutic environments, especially at Fight With Insight. So this was just a, a graphic that I developed with Fight With Insight and some of their OTs around understanding proximal, distal and interoceptive senses. And this is really what stimulated my interest in this area. In terms of my findings, I was trying to find a language and spectrum that didn't imply dysfunction or defectiveness with atypical children. So I was really saying, what are some of the different drivers of behavior which in either direction doesn't imply a problem, but rather an opportunity. And so really looking at sensory engagement and how it enhances our lives and how it helps us to regulate ourselves and engage with the world in a different way. I think the greatest aha from my research was just the amount of creativity and invention that happens in this, what I refer to as biosocial borderlands. So neurodiverse children, how they come up with new ways of doing things, new ways of engaging with the world um, and, and how that can benefit humanity. So as part of this process, I would very much like to create a dedicated sensory space for the autism school and for the children that occupy the CMI space. In this space, I'd love to collaborate with the various people who work in the space to explore what's happening in the sensory world and how do we understand the sensory world from a different perspective. So looking at sensory language where children are nonverbal but creating new ways of, in, of engaging and speaking to each other without using language. Looking at sensory learning, how do we engage with our environment in different ways. And finally, this idea of sensory empathy where children are able to almost instill themselves into new environments and do the most amazing things once they have regulated their sensory world. So this is currently the old pool area um, that I'm talking about. And in the pool, I'd love to create a massive ball pond for the children to enjoy. 
And in the arch space, there's obviously um, quite a lot of strength there, so we can put some sensory swings in. In the area where the um, where all of the windows are, and there's sort of a back storage area, I'd like to create some sand therapy stations, and possibly also, because there's so much sunshine, some sort of a living wall of succulents and plants that the children can interact with. In the cubicles, um, you've got these funny little cubicles where people used to get changed. I think we could create sensory cubicles where children could go into those spaces and touch the walls or balance on a balance board and basically engage with their senses on their own in those little cubicles. And that's pretty much the end of the presentation. I just want to talk timing and next steps. So obviously we have a definite launch date of um, Friday the 27th as a media launch date of October. A public launch of the 29th, 28th and 29th of October, um, possibly looking at launching the school sensory space in November, um, and then maybe the sensory research center sometime in the new year. Um, obviously, we'd like to start with some CMI community engagement. So we'd like to spend the start of August just introducing everybody to the thinking. And that's what this presentation is about. And you can also download it as a presentation, just a PowerPoint presentation, if you want to look at all the slides individually. And obviously, please feel free to engage with me at any stage. Then looking at doing the brand uh, community engagement workshop around the end of August. So the 29th of August is a possible date where we introduce you to branding and brand strategy. We look at the individual brands and help you refine them. We look at our part, how we're going to partner each other and our CMI community values and win-win model where we start working together uh, more effectively as a brand community. Then obviously we'd like to kick off very quickly with the space development because there's quite a lot to do. So obviously the archival team will need to drive the content around um, what's happening around the uh, past space. Uh, we need to work together with all of your brand people to develop the present space. And obviously, we'd really welcome your input on the, um, the future sensory space. These are just ideas that we're putting down on paper. From a logistics and costing point of view, um, this is very much a space that I, Dr. D. Blackie, would like to contribute towards the CMI as a sustainable space to generate revenue for both the CM CMI and its partner brands. So in terms of the actual building of the space, I will be contributing much of that. And obviously, we'll see where I can try and get sponsorship and partnership to help me. Um, we'll also then look at once the space starts operating, that once the operational costs are covered, the remainder of the money then goes to CMI. And if it's retail brands that have been contributed on behalf of a particular organization, any profits from that would obviously go towards those partner organizations. We obviously want to also build um, partner brand awareness and donor support, uh, both internally and externally. So um, both organizations within CMI, but also looking at becoming a broader hub for the uh, child protection community, the neurodiversity community, and the child empowerment community. Um, we're obviously going to be creating lots of awareness for our various NPOs. We want to do obviously some work around helping you with uh, brand understanding and engagement and awareness. Um, and then obviously there's also a great opportunity for part-time work opportunities for some of our CMI staff, some of our OT therapists um, to actually engage in the space and run workshops, help us with hosting, help us with actually running and managing the space. From an online point of view, we'll obviously need to develop the website. Um, we'd love to develop an app and we're working on that. Um, and then obviously there will be quite a big social media um, strategy and implementation around the launch and ongoing. From a tickets point of view, we'll probably look to outsource that possibly to somebody like Quicket, um, which is a, an easy payment method. Um, we'd love to create a universal uh, payment system for all of our partners. I know a lot of you use SnapScan. Um, and so I, I would like to recommend that we all try and sign up to SnapScan as a way of getting donor funding, but that it is one way of doing payment. And finally, obviously, there's the space development. So um, which is, as I've mentioned, going to be a combination of myself and courage, as well as other do donors that I'd like to get on board, as well as hopefully all of your input as partners into helping us create the space. So those are the logistics as they stand. And that's the end of the presentation. I would love to hear your input. I'd love your feedback. I've put my contact information on here, so you're welcome to contact me. 
and share your thoughts and ideas. And if you'd like to be part of this journey, we'd very much like everybody, as many people as possible, to be on board. Thank you so much.